Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Fadil Santosa. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Yunnan Yang. Um, Yunnan got her PhD uh, in 2018 from University of Texas at Austin, uh, working with Bjorn and Chris. Uh, and uh, after that, she went to NYU uh, as a current instructor, where, where she's been. Um, she's, uh, I think, moving to Cornell after this. Um, yeah, she she was um, uh, involved with the Odin Institute at UT Austin and uh, was selected as a participant at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum in Germany. Uh, and she also um, won among her honors her first prize in the 19th IMA Leslie Fox Prize in numerical analysis. Today, uh, Yunnan is going to give a talk uh, about optimal transport and inverse problem and implicit regularization. Okay, Yunnan, take it away. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I want to thank uh, the organizers for this invitation. Um, so um, so today, clearly from the title, you can see I will focus on two um, main keywords. One is optimal transport, and another is to use the two optimal transport to solve certain inverse problems. So I would like to first give an overview of what is the inverse problem I'm talking about in this uh, presentation. So for inverse problem, I think it's not a strange topic for uh, audience of this seminar. So it's, we are exactly doing the opposite of what people do regard as the modeling step. So for people who belong to modeling and simulation, they are usually given the parameter and they want to find the best way to describe the physical process. And usually we may want to solve a particular partial differential equation as accurate as possible. So for example, numerical solution to PD belong to the the upper picture that I show in this slide. So that's about the modeling step, which we often refer to as the forward problem in the context of the inverse problem. And for people like me, I'm interested in solving inverse problem, which means I actually know some of the information about the physical process. For example, how uh, the wave pressure field and the, world, the, the heat distribution, et cetera. But I want to take advantage of the information I get Sometimes it's directly the observation of the state, uh, directly the state itself, but sometimes it's just observable of the state can be a function of the state. And I want to use such information to infer back what is unknown parameter that decide this information that I'm looking at. So earlier in the discussion, we were talking about a puzzle, but I often regard uh, solving inverse problem is about solving a puzzle because you do have all the information you need. It's all embedded in your data, but the the job we need to do is to basically peel out all the, all the take advantage of all the clues and try to find the true answer to this type of data, which is finding the correct parameter. And the common inverse, common inverse uh, problem include one uh, like finding the earthquake source once an earthquake happens, or there's a, a, a piece of material and there, we want to uh, investigate whether this material has artifact or not. Clearly, we cannot really break the material and see if there's artifact. So we want to use some image-based uh, technique to find the artifact, or the most commonly used uh, medical imaging techniques such as X-rays, CT, CAT scan, or ultrasound, they all belong to the inverse problem category. And the particular inverse problem I talk about today, where I centered around, uh, I will center around today, is still uh, uh, related to wave equation. But instead of doing uh, ultrasound for the material or for part of the body tissue, we are going to do uh, like court uh, ultrasound to part of the earth. And that, that's the sesame inverse problem. So, but the mechanism are very similar to uh, other like a wave based in inversion for uh, material or for um, uh, body or medical imaging. So the problem set up is the following. Uh, we want to know what's underneath the ground, but we don't know that to be a, a priori unless we dig a hole and to measure. So, we want to know what's going on under the ground. And in order to have some information, we create our own wave source, which is this vibrator truck. The truck bounces back and forth and generates waves. And due to the proper physical properties of waves, it just propagates in three directions. And some of the wave will go uh, propagate down through the material of the Earth. So then there will be certain transmission, reflection, or refraction. So for those reflection and the refractions, they will continue, they will come back to our surface. For example, reflection will just reach a discontinuity and come back. That's the scattering. 
where continuous refraction will also come back. Basically, the transmission gets just a uh, twisted angle, but eventually they will come back to our surface. So those type of data are information we can record based on the sensors that lined up on the surface. So for us, the data available are the waveforms measured from the sensors. And the unknown that we want to reconstruct is exactly what's going on underneath the ground. So just have a close look at what is known and what is unknown. So what known are what we can capture from the orange dots, the sensor in the previous slides. And the sensors, as you can see, they are placed at different locations. And also for each sensor, there's a continuous sampling of the information. Therefore, for each sensor, there is one wiggle in this vertical direction. And the, the time, uh, so because we continue sample the data, so we have a time series related to this sensor. And since we have so many sensors together, we line up all of the information, and this gives us this 2D or even 3D waveforms. And that's the information available to us. And the reason why they look continuous when we uh, uh, like align them all together is based on the physics that the wave propagation. The data we record from this sensor is not entirely independent of the, the time series recorded on this sensor. So that's why uh, that's actually nice for our uh, inverse problem because we have redundancy in our data. And what we want to reconstruct is exactly what's underneath the ground. And that what a uh, common property that we search for will be wave velocity, like how fast the wave transport in that media, or for example, material density. And uh, usually we can categorize in uh, an image like the right hand side. And that's kind of very important for practitioners because different material like oil, or sand, or shale, or rock, they have a different property, such as how fast the wave propagates in that material. So this is the underneath imaging that we want to reconstruct. And this is the application background. One can also translate it into mathematics. And we need a forward model to characterize this entire inverse problem. And the forward problem here clearly will be related to the wave propagation. Uh, one can use acoustic wave equation or elastic wave equation or even more complicated viscoelastic plus attenuation, etc. Uh, for simplicity, I just show, I just assume that my forward problem is this simple acoustic wave equation. And together with our application setting in the two sides before, we already know the source because that's our vibrator track that bounces back and forth. So we already know that. And we also know this is actually a bounded domain, so we uh, it's a half space problem. And we observe some U, but we didn't observe the entire wave, uh, solution everywhere in space. We only observe it on the upper boundary. So the forward map is actually give me any parameter M, then I have a solution U related or restricted on the uh, upper boundary. So that's the forward problem. And the, the inverse problem is the other way around. If I only have waveform observations on upper boundary, which is only a subset of really the boundary, then how can I reconstruct M? So this is the mathematical setup of the forward problem and the inverse problem. And here the coefficient that we are interested in actually belong to the, uh, for example, L2 functional space. So it's actually an infinite dimensional uh, inverse problem. So one thing that I want to remark is the difficulty of this inverse problem. First of all, although we know wave equation quite from, uh, quite early in graduate school uh, from the first course on PDE, et cetera. We know this is a standard benchmark hyperbolic equation, second order uh, linear equation. But the linearity is really about the source and the solution U. However, in our problem, we are not interested in the source, but more like the variable coefficient, the media. Therefore, the map from U to M or vice versa from M to U are highly nonlinear. And that make it the inverse problem extremely hard because there's no explicit way that I can represent what how you depend on M analytically uh, because of the variable coefficient. Unless M is a constant, we may have a good luck there, but M is a variable coefficient that depends on space. So we cannot represent the connection analytically. And that was a huge uh, difficulty if we just want to proceed to solve the problem from this perspective. But on the other hand, practitioners still want to solve such a big application because it's all related to energy and also uh, like earthquake inversion. There's many, many related problems uh, of this formulation. 
So an alternative way of solving this inverse problem is turn to PDE constraint optimization. Basically saying, instead of trying to mathematically derive what is this G or what is that F, we consider the optimal M that we are searching for is the particular one that minimizes the difference between the synthetic data which are generated by my current guess of the verbal coefficient versus the true data that I can observe from the fields. So once we can reformulate this inverse problem as a PD constraint optimization, it we basically offer us a, a pathway to solve such a problem by a lot of uh, optimization techniques. So uh, from uh, here, from this point, I will then uh, focus on this PD constraint optimization. So we regard the particular choice of M that minimize the differences between the synthetic and the, the truth as our uh, parameter that we really want to uh, uh, search for. And the rest follow standard optimization framework. Uh, we have an initial guess based on the, uh, so much information we know priori. And then we insert that initial guess to a wave solver. And the after forward modeling, basically wave, wave solver, uh, solving wave equation. And then we obtain the solution everywhere on the domain if I solve the wave equation uh, good enough. And then I restrict part of the wave solution on the boundary. So it's the same places that I record the data in the field and I compare the differences between the real data and the synthetic data. And the objective function will tell me how far away my synthetic data is away from the real data, which is an indicator how far away my initial guess is away from the truth. And we start from that using uh, gradient descent or any optimization algorithm and update the velocity. And then we do it over again. So that's a standard optimization framework. Although this framework seems to be doable, but there are two particular uh, parts that make it a little bit difficult. One is, although nowadays we know how to solve wave equation pretty well with a, a very rich uh, library of all numerical methods, but still we need to do time marching. And also based on the scale of the wave equation, because it's seismic wave equation rather than uh, body tissue. So the scale is in kilometers. So solving one wave equation for seismic inversion is still the most expensive part of this entire frame framework. Therefore, we don't want to solve the wave equation too many times. We want to limit the computational cost. So that's one thing. And the second is once we discretize M, it was the original function, but once we discretize it, uh, if I want to have a very fine detail of the picture of the ima sub uh, subsurface image, I need to discrete M into, like, for example, easily 1 million variables, 1,000 by 1,000 uh, for 2D. And if that's the case, which means your variable is a million variable, and uh, that make it uh, impossible to do any global optimization. Therefore, these two uh, sides constrain that the, uh, the shape or the property of the objective function basically decides how many wave equations I need to solve, and also how what will be my optimization behavior. Will I get stuck local minimum, or uh, will I get the solution immediately? So optimize, uh, objective function here is a cruise crucial component, and that's what I will focus here after. So now let's look at what the classical obje objective function is. So it's very similar to all regression or inverse problem. The first objective function anybody will reach uh, to, to apply is the least square formulation, and it was proposed by Tarantola in 1982. So we just measure their uh, L2 difference in time and sum over all the receivers. And usually there will be a regularization on top of that uh, after this uh, formulation. But immediately people see there are two difficulties associated with the formulation. First of all, earlier we say the inverse problem is highly nonlinear, which means the dependency from M to F is nonlinear. And once we put them into this quadratic formulation, the optimization landscape of M is also not expected to be strongly convex. It's actually very, very non-convex. Therefore, if we don't start somewhere really close to the truth, easily we'll get stuck at the local minimum because, uh, due to we are using local-based gradient descent-based methods. And the second, which is shared by all the square formulation, as it, if without any regularization, the, pro, uh, the reconstruction or the minimizer of this objective function is very sensitive to the noise in G. Because the objective function, if G is uh, polluted by noise, 
the objective function not only capture the physical differences between synthetic and the truth, but also capture the noise. And if I minimize them to zero, I will fit the noise. So based on these two motivation, we want to change the objective function. And before we change the objective function, we want to understand what is the actual continuous dependency between my parameter M and my data S. Why is it important to understand this continuous dependency? Because it's like solving a puzzle. What I can see is always the data. Data is a representation of my parameter M. Understanding how the data is connected to M will help me greatly to design an effective objective function. So unfortunately for wave equation, as I said earlier, most of the time, we will not be able to write it down the analytical dependence between the variable coefficient and the solution, unless it's a constant coefficient. So here I'm uh, really restrain myself to this very uh, simple case where we can say something is analytically. So what do you see right now is a 1D wave equation, 1D wave equation with a constant coefficient. And we know by that long barrier formulation, we can represent the solution U quite well by the boundary condition. So uh, if the boundary condition is phi, then I can represent U as phi uh, characteristic T minus square root of M or times X. So based on this formulation, I basically can see how you will change as M change. So for fixed location X, a little bit of perturbation in M will give me translations in U. And for fixed time, a little bit of perturbation in M will give me dilations in U, which means if I do not have the correct uh, uh, variable coefficient M, or if the M has a little bit of perturbation, what we see from the data side are purely translation and dilation. So this is a continuous dependency I was talking about two minutes ago. And we want to understand, okay, this is the direct relationship between my data and my parameter. So if I want to design an objective function, I want my objective function to be able to capture this continuous dependency. So next slide, we can see how terribly L2 norm cannot fail to really capture this continuous dependency. So in the bottom, of, I want to compare two set of wavelets the blue one and the red one. So the blue and the red two wavelets, they are simply a translation of each other. So it's uh, purely translation differences. And they are easily caused from the previous slides. They are easily caused by incorrect wave speed. And the next, I'm going to measure their differences by the L2 norm. And you can see as a function of translation, the L2 norm has a very, very non-convex optimization landscape, which means if you are using local optimization such as gradient or Hessian based uh, technique, you have to start somewhere really close to the truth. Otherwise, anything that away from this window, we will not be able to convert to the truth. We will instead convert to a local minimum. So that's basically demonstrate how severe the issue is even for this very, very simple comparison. On the other hand, still comparing these two wavelets, but we use optimal transport based techniques, uh, based distance, which is the quadratic Vachelson distance, then we get a globally convex optimization landscape. So this is a direct motivation for us to really go for or to further investigate what is the benefit and what we can gain and what may be the potential limitations of using the quadratic Vachelson distance as an objective function. And this also takes us to my second part of the talk, optimal transport. And that's the tool I'm going to use to solve uh, or to tackle the difficulties based on least square based uh, for least square based seismic inversion. So just want to give an overview of optimal transport. Uh, it was proposed two or three hundred years ago by Munch, and the Munch uh, came up with this problem. I have one pile of sand and I have a big hole. They have the same volume, and what I want to do is very simply fill fill up the hole. But because the volume here is kind of big, it's two dimension or three dimension. So I actually have a lot of way to, to do this rearrangement. For example, I can move the left to the left, right to the right. That's one way of filling up the hole. But I can also say, okay, the right seems to be close to the left. Let me do this first. And then the left to the right. So that's giving me another transportation. And there are actually infinite, uh, infinite many uh, transport, transport, uh, transportation maps were transfers plans to do this rearrangement. And his question was, which one is the most efficient and saves the most effort? 
it was a very, very, is a, it was a problem, very easy to formulate, but very hard to solve for two reasons. First of all, he's searching for an optimal plan in a functional space is infinite dimensional. And the second, the transport map based on his original formulation is not linear. It's not linear with respect to the map. Basically, uh, and this nonlinearity together with the infinite dimensional make it very difficult to solve. So there's not much progress until counter ravage in 1940s. He, he, reformed, he relaxed the problem a little bit. Instead of finding a map, he said, why not just, just relax a little bit, allow X at this mass to transport to both Y1 and Y2. So it's no longer mathematically a function, but he uh, counter average was able to reformulate it into a linear problem. So at that time, people can solve this problem actually numerically by linear program. And later in the late 20th century, there's a, a lot of fruitful development in the theoretical side of optimal transport. And those fruitful theoretical understanding actually give rise to a lot of uh, application starting 2000 in image processing, in machine learning, in inverse problem, and even recently in model reduction for hyperbolic equations. So this is what, what, what I have been witnessing in the past one decade about the development in these areas. And also optimal transfer is quite related to other um, uh, classical math, mathematical subject, for example, differential geometry. So in 1991, Jan Bernier uh, proved that the optimal map for quadratic Wasserstein distance is nothing but the gradient of the solution U, which U solves this following Monchampar equation. So this gives us a pathway to find the optimal map. You just simply insert your uh, one distribution F on the left uh, on the numerator and the other distribution in the denominator. And if you can solve the Monchampar equation, then you basically get the optimal map. So that was a very interesting uh, discovery because the Monchampar equation is now new since it has been studied in differential geometry since 1916 uh, by Weil and Minkowski problems. So for people familiar with differential geometry, that's really the classical problems. So that build up the connection between optimal transport and the geometric measure theory. And another very interesting and significant discovery was done by uh, this paper we refer to as JKO, standing for the initial of the authors in 1998. So if you want to, uh, if we have, if we are given uh, energy functional such as a Boltzmann H functional or for fun, a Boltzmann H functional plus potential or internal energy or interaction energy. Those are very common energy people in kinetic theory studies. If this is my functional that I want to minimize, and if you think your row or assume your row belong to the Wasserstein space, quadratic Wasserstein space, then the corresponding gradient flow actually recovers things that the PDEs that we already know really well, such as heat equation, Foucault equation, Perl's median, and the Minkowski lasso. So that also build a very nice connection between optimal transfer and the kinetic description. And I can see the application uh, in these two big areas also uh, blooming. And finally, uh, this is some discovery I made last month when I was preparing a preprint. So you, I, I have been studying optimal transfer for seven, eight years. And each time I have a paper, when you know you submit to the journal, the journal will ask for mathematics subject classification. And in the past, we were dealing with 2010 mathematics subject classification. And I searched optimal transfer, I found nothing. There's no keyword or classification called optimal transport. And I did that again last month. And that was within the uh, MSC 2020 database. And it actually jumped out some of the information, which means actually starting 2020, optimal transportation has its own unique mathematics subject classification now. So that's the number that I will attach to a lot of the paper I will have in this area. And I feel this is a, this contrast between 2010 and the 2020 is an indicator how many uh, research or how many papers actually is as they were in this area. And that's why there's a need to have a unique classification number for optimal transportation. And finally, based on after all this introduction, I can finally uh, just mathematic or first cartoon-ish describe what is optimal transport and finally a mathematical formulation follows. Okay, so the, the, so the cartoon-ish um, uh, description is aligned with Munch's problem. We have two pair of signs or two distribution. They don't look the same and we want to compare them, how, how, how differences 
what, what, how different they are from each other. So the way of optimal transport comparing these two is very interesting. You need to first rearrange them to make them the same. Okay, once I find a way to rearrange them to make the same, which is easy since they have equal total mass. And then we want to measure how much effort I made to make them the same. And the effort is calculated in the way that it's always the amount you move multiply the distance you move. And it's no matter how, which cost you use and how complicated the distribution looks like, it's always this two direction or two yeah, intensity differences in the vertical direction corresponding to the amount we moved, multiply the distance we moved. It's always this two direction. And this is what I regard as a fundamental difference from the general LP norms, because LP class of um, matrix or norms they only consider vertical direction differences and never ever consider the horizontal direction. And that actually explained a lot why earlier when I was comparing that two wavelengths, the blue and the red one, the L2 norm gave me a very non-convex optimization, optimized non-convex optimization landscape, but the Varsha and distance gave me globally convex optimization, optimization landscape. Because of Varsha and distance, Indeed, at every point, capture the distance we moved horizontally. And the, the mathematical formula definition of the quadratic Varshus and or any p Varshus and distance is has a one to has a one to one correspondence to my cartoon explanation. So uh, f of x uh, represents how much mass you want to move at the location x, and you want to move that mass from location x to t of x, and that this term represents the distance. So for each point, this is your transportation cost. And we integrate over the entire domain that give us the total transportation cost, which actually, if I find the minimum or the optimal transport plan that can do this rearrangement and minimize this integral, that will be my Varshus and distance. And here I focus on P equal to two, but P equal to one is also widely used in many applications. So next I'm going to say, uh, or uh, briefly, um, try to introduce some theory why Varshus and Dyson will be a better candidate to solve the sesame inversion problem that we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Remember for the L2 based sesame inversion, we have two challenges. One is the encounter of local minimum. And the second is the sensitivity to noise in the data. And here I will present this theorem to say why Varshus and Dyson is better with local minimum. So next I'm going to set up a, a, a site uh, to have a setting. So G is what I regard as a fixed distribution. So it's going to fix the remain, uh, but F really actually depends on G. So F is a translated and a dilated version of G. So the translation is uh, have variable in every uh, direction. So here uh, translation coefficient, uh, we have S1 all the way to SD basically allowing us to have different translation in different dim dimension, uh, different, yeah, different dimension. And similarly, the dilation parameter also can be different in different direction. And therefore, F really depends on G based on this 2D number of variables characterizing the translation and the dilation. And since both F and G are probability density functions, I can compare the Varshus and distance between these two. And the Varshus and distance will automatically depends on how this uh, set of 2D parameters. So the Varshus and distance between these two as we prove will be a convex function, joint convex function of both the translation variables S and the dilation variable lambda, which indicating that the Varshus and distance will be jointly convex in translation and the dilation. And remember uh, earlier we said translation and dilation is exactly the continuous dependence between my observed data and my parameter that I want to reconstruct. And that's what the Russia Sandison really has a natural property of capturing that. And the rep as a representation or a realization of this theorem, I can show you the inverse uh, process using the L2 based uh, objective function and the Russia Stan objective function. So on the left is L2 and uh, on the right is W2, while the first the row you are seeing is the uh, with a uh, variable coefficient, the, the parameter that I want to reconstruct. It got, it got updated uh, iteration by iteration. And the bottom row, what you are seeing is the data residual. And here the data residual is simply the subtracted difference between the synthetic and the truth. 
since we are doing a data fitting procedure to solve the inverse problem. A good sign of doing a good job of that is to have the data residual or between these two diminish. So they start with exactly the same initial guess, but the L2 based inversion and the W2 based inversion follow very drastic different uh, convergence behavior. So you can see not only from the inversion, but also from the residual. On the right hand side, the W2 residual almost all gone in like 100 iterations. But the L2 based residual has a lot of the parts that we cannot fit, which means also an indication that the, the optimization process gets stuck at a local minimum. So even if we don't know the truth, like what the true parameter looks like, you can just look at the residual to justify which method is better. It just look at how much data we fit. So this is a sign that the Washington distance is better at dealing with local minima than the L2 norm, especially for this wave inversion problem. And the second challenge that we mentioned earlier is the sensitivity to noise. And we also have a theorem corresponding to that. Again, G is a fixed probability distribution and F is a perturbed version. And the delta here we resorted to be, to have, to be mean zero because I want F, both F and G to be uh, density functions. So, and this noise actually have variance sigma square. If I want to compare F and G in L2 norm, that's exactly measuring the variance. And we will have estimate of order of sigma square. That's to be expected in some statistics. On the other hand, if we want to compare the noisy data F and the clean data G under the Washington distance, the estimate is very surprising because it, it still depends on uh, the amount or the strength of the noise, which is the variance of the noise but also depends on how dense that noise is, in, uh, is imposed onto this clean data, where n here is number of intervals that I impose piecewise constant noise. So I divide the domain into n sub intervals and at each interval there is, is constant, the noise is constant and that constant follows certain distribution. So this estimate tells us very ironically, the denser the noise, the bigger the n, the smaller the noise get uh, captured by the Washington distance, which is saying Washington distance is insensitive to high frequency noise. As the n gets bigger, the frequency content of this noise also gets bigger. So that's a very counterintuitive uh, way of uh, looking at it because usually by our eyeball norm, the denser the noise, the easier we can, we can, we can see, we can sense the noise. But for Washington distance is the other way around, the denser the noise, the less the Russian and distance can see the noise. And if my objective function cannot sense the noise, then your reconstruction will not overfit that noise. So the reconstruction will be noise robust. And we also can have a numerical example to demonstrate this theoretical property. So here we create such noisy observed data. So the, the blue one in this picture are noisy waveforms. Uh, and that you can see the noise is relative strong is 0.76 dB. And the noise is uh, make it also slightly correlated with the observed data. So it's not just IID noise, they are, uh, they are correlated with neighbors and with the truth. And I will use such noise to as my reference data and I will try to minimize uh, the difference between my synthetic data and the reference data. So we can also demonstrate the optimization process by a uh, video. So on the left hand side, we start with exactly the same initial gas as in the noise free situation. And the, on the right hand side, you can see the iterative change of the simulated data compared to the true data. So as iteration continues, the black time series is my simulated synthetic data. So let me play it again. So it's changing, but on the left hand side, we are also converging. And at the end of about 80, 90 iterations, it reached all the optimization uh, convergence criteria, like gradient zero, et cetera. And then we look at the reconstruction. In spite we have such big amount of noise, the reconstruction is still very similar to the previous noise-free case. And also to the truth that we see maybe on the second slide of this presentation. Although we have slightly more noise imprint, uh, in this picture compared to the previous image in the noise-free case, but there's no wrong geom uh, geometry. There's no wrong structure. It's just some noisy artifact. So for geologists, this picture is still as valuable as the previous um, noise-free re uh, reconstruction. So they basically, basically belong to the same category that there's no local minimum. 
Okay. Now we look at the right hand side, and that's where the iteration uh, stops. And when I first look at this, this the picture, when the iteration stops, I looks like it. I don't understand why it stopped because by my eyes or by L two norm, the difference between my reference data, the the blue one, and my synthetic data, uh, the black one, are so huge. Like, but I think I was falling into the tradition that how we usually compare signals. Yes, they look is very very different under our eyes under the L2 norm, but they look very, very tiny. They, the difference between the blue and the black are very tiny because of the Wasserstein distance is very insensitive to high frequency data. So there's actually uh, two ways that I can help to make sense of this. One is related to how optimal transport compare uh, signals at the first beginning. It's always the amount we move multiply the distance we move. So for this part, Yes, it looks a little bit big, like the difference between uh, black and blue point-wise, it looks very big. But because it has mean zero, so I don't have to move much. I can only move very, very tiny amount. Immediately, I can cancel out of that noise. So it's really this part being small that makes the Wasserstein distance in the end, these two multiply together is extremely small. So that's where one sens insensitivity comes from. And another connection why Wasserstein distance is insensitive to high frequency noise actually is closely related to its connection with uh, weak or negative sublief norm. And that come, takes us to the third part of my presentation, implicit regularization. So this actually some recent and also uh, uh, some uh, work 20 years ago. So first of all, let's look at an asymptotic connection between Wasserstein distance, W2 and H minus one semi norm. So here in the paper by Felix Otto and Cedric Villani, they proved that if I'm comparing two probability measures that are super close to each other in the linearization regime, then the Wasserstein distance between these two is asymptotically the difference is H minus one semi norm. Okay, so that's the asymptotic connection. And recently, Remy Perry also proved that if you are compare two probability distribution, even if they are not close enough in the linearization regime, but as long as they are bounded above and below by the same two constants. We can still set have a very clear equivalence between the H minus one semi norm for the Lebesgue measure and the Wasserstein distance. So both the asymptotic connection and the non-asymptotic uh, asymptotic connection are telling the same message that Wasserstein distance in terms of spectral bias is quite close to the weakness of the H minus one semi norm. And here I say weakness doesn't mean it's a bad norm, it's just how we characterize those norms. So it's about its spectral bias. So let's just have a quick look at what is HS norm. There's a multiple way one can define Sobolev HS norm, the Sobolev norms related to L2. Uh, one way is the refer transform. So for example, if I want to compare the difference between uh, AM and G, like solving a linear regression problem, then the HS norm will be, first of all, we take a full transform of the input, okay? And then next, we are going to weight different frequency content differently. And that's where this cos to the power of 2s comes in. If we are, say, if we are saying like, well, I want to resort to back to L2 norm, that's equivalent to say s equal to zero, which is exactly uh, means we treat every frequency exactly the same. Every frequency has weight one. But the different choice of non-zero s means it's, it's, input, it's basically impo, uh, enforcing an implicit bias. For example, if you choose positive S, then this formulation or this definition tells us if you choose H1 or H2 norm, it means you treat or you regard the higher frequency content of your data much more important than the lower frequency content of the data. So that's the implicit bias there, which you basically implicit saying which part of data you trust better. But if you choose a negative S, then it's the other way around, which means we treat the lower frequency data much more robust, much higher, much bigger weight than the higher frequency data. And that's where the implicit bias come from, just by choosing a different objective function. Since the Wasserstein distance is related to H negative one norm based on the previous slides. So one can uh, basically asymptotically considering Wasserstein distance also have this property of having a much bigger weight on the lower frequency content than the higher frequency content. So here I'm trying to solve a linear regression problem, but instead of using L2 norm, we are using HS norm. 
and there, it has a direct consequence of our reconstruction. So since this is a very is a linear problem and also very analytical, so we can write it down what is the solution and at the Cauchy frequency content. So it's, it's basically a weighted least square solution uh, where this data get normalized or get reweighted. So if I, my data at the Cauchy level has higher frequency content, high, higher frequency noise, then the data at the Cauchy level has a lot of noise that is not great, I want to avoid. Then choosing a negative norm basically dumped that amount of frequency or that can, uh, the weight in that frequency. And then it won't back propagate it to your solution. The other way around, if you don't use S being negative or you use S equal to zero or even S equal to one, which means at that Cauchy level, we already have a lot of noise, but we actually amplify that. We make that noise even bigger. And then the reconstruction at the Cauchy level will be much, much worse. And we will see a lot of noise uh, content in the reconstruction. So that's where we can play a little bit by imposing implicit regularization by choosing a different objective function. And if we take an inverse Fourier transform of this, we get a solution in the physical domain. And the physical domain looks like, literally looks like a weighted, weighted least square solution with the weighting operator P directly come from the definition of HS norm. And with S being negative, this is an integral operator. So it smooths out the higher frequency noise. But with P being positive, this is a differential operator that will make images sharper, but that also amplifies the noise in the data. So if your data has noise using positive S norm will make the data, make the noise even worse. So that's the implicit bias. So that was uh, like a very nice skin. Like if you, you think we, we record data from realistic application, there's always noise. So this seemed to be a very uh, convincing message that you should always use negative norms. But that's actually not the truth because there is a slightly uh, disadvantage of using weaker or negative norms uh, in, uh, in our image or inverse problem. And the reason is we lose resolution and that's not very hard to expect because when we weight the data with Cauchy to the power of minus two, for example, you not only have a small weight on the noise, but you also have a small weight on the physical content of the higher frequency. And as a result, the reconstruction uh, at the higher frequency will be less accurate, will be almost zero. And that's how we lose resolution. So this theorem basically is telling this, uh, or conveying this message. Uh, so we basically, if we solve the problem very nicely and we uh, get an uh, error between the truth and the, our reconstruction. And the, the left-hand side error is scale like delta to the power of one over alpha plus beta minus s. So what is delta? Delta is the strength of the noise, is the HS norm of the noise. And alpha is the smoothness of the forward problem. And the, uh, and the beta, uh, beta is where you think your uh, reconstruction parameter lives in, which functional space is lives in. Most of the time, we cannot choose delta, alpha, or beta. They are given by our data, or by, given by our forward problem, or given by the natural property of that PDE. But what we have choice over most of the time is S. You can choose different norm or different objective function to do your uh, inverse data matching. But this estimate tells us uh, overall, the worst situation scenario is that uh, the smaller the S, the bigger the epsilon. The bigger the S, the smaller the epsilon, which means when you use weaker norms, we lose resolution. And that this two message from this slide and this slide, the gain part and the loss part can be also summarized by this very simple numerical example of kernel deconvolution. It's a linear inverse problem. So the first row here are reconstruction using different objective functions. But the first row does not have a noise. The data has no noise. So the left column is L2 based reconstruction. The middle is H minus one, and the right is W2. So you can see in the noise free situation, L2 gets much big, much better resolution. For example, it captures the edges much better compared to H minus one, W2, who are weaker norms. So that's what I referred earlier as a loss of resolution. We can match the low wave number component of this truth pretty well, but for high wave number component, like those edges, it's gone. So that's the, uh, the, the, the shortcoming. 
Well, as long as there's slightly some noise in your data, the story suddenly changed. So still we do the same set of reconstruction, but now the, there's noise, literally there's noise in the data. But the L2 reconstruction uh, immediately deteriorate a lot. Like there's a lot of wrong features everywhere. But the L2, uh, sorry, the H minus one, the W2 reconstruction still look almost exactly the same as the noise free situation. And this comparison demonstrating the gain part, which is the robustness to noise. So whether you choose H a negative norm or stronger norm really depends on how much amount of noise in your data and also depends on the stage of your inverse problem. And the finally, uh, we basically extend this uh, entire uh, idea of changing different objective functions to a Bayesian setting. The reason is sometimes I look at this deterministic framework of solving inverse problem and a Bayesian framework of solving inverse problem. There's a lot of similarity uh, and uh, analogies between each other. So for example, we deterministically, we have objective function. Bayesian-wise, we have LACU function, which is also capturing the data, data misfit. Deterministically, we have regularization. Bayesian, we have prior distribution. And then in order to explore the solution, deterministically, we have op optimization algorithms. But in Bayesian, in order to explore the posterior distribution, one need to sample, sample the distribution. So because those correspondence, uh, the idea came up, why not we try to investigate what does it mean or what's the benefit or potential non-benefit of using the Wasserstein distance as a likely function in Bayesian. So that's what this work with uh, McDonald from our uh, current we were uh, studying about. So first of all, in order for some uh, potential to be a likely function, there is usually an underlying noise assumption behind it. For example, if you assume the noise model is standard Gaussian that directly generate the L2 based likely function. But if you assume your noise eta is still additive but not standard anymore, there's actually a covariance operator. Then you end up with a different objective function. In this case, we'll give you H minus one semi norm. And one main contribution of this work is to study what does it mean to use the and distance as your likely function. So in the end, it turned out to be you are assuming a multiplicative noise between the data and the, the, the synthetic. And the multiplicative noise is also state dependent, which means the covariance operator depends on which state, which you we are talking about at that point. So there is some adaptiveness in this choice. And finally, multiplicative noise has been studied a lot in Bayesian inference. A standard multiplicative noise gives you a likelihood function that looks like a normalized L2 norm. So this is the one contribution for us to understand what does it really mean um, to have the Wasserstein distance as likelihood function. And uh, this noise model made me feel quite realistic, especially for nonlinear inverse problems. And the second, another main contribution will highlight of this work is to see the robustness of the or noise sensitivity, noise insensitivity that I mentioned earlier in the deterministic framework can also apply here. But remember for Bayesian inference, the true solution are the posterior distribution. So here I study how the posterior distribution get perturbed if my data get perturbed. So we have a Y and a Y prime, you can consider them as clean and noisy data. And because we have different clean and noisy data, we will corresponding have different posterior distribution. And the theorem tells us by choosing different objective function or by choosing different likely function like L2 based likely function or W2 based likely function, we have different stability estimate. So the Hellinger distance between, between this noisy W2 posterior and the clean W2 posterior is bounded below by a constant times the noise H minus one norm. While the second tells us the L2 based posterior, noisy L2 posterior and the clean L2 posterior is bounded below by a constant of the L2 difference between the data. So if we look at the right hand side, when Y minus Y prime, for example, is sine KX, then the H minus one norm between them will be order of one over K, while the L2 norm will be order one, which is the illustration that for the right hand side, the H minus one norm is much, much small if my frequency so if my state, if my noise between the clean and the, the noisy one, the noise in the middle is high frequency. So that's another 
uh, the illustration that the Russia sand distance is insensitive to noise. And that this is a counterpart from what we discover in the deterministic perspective. So from both the deterministic and the Bayesian perspective, one can see using W2 norm or using other uh, weaker norms, we will gain a lot of stability with respect to noise. And finally, I think I would like to draw my conclusion. So the, the proposal of using the quadratic Russian sand distance was really made, motivated by the difficulty we observe by using L2 or L, generally LP-based inversion for especially seismic setting. So number one challenge was uh, the, the problem is nonlinear, so the optimization is non-convex. And using the original method, we get stuck at local minima most of the time, unless we know the truth pretty well. And the solution is W2 will have a bigger basin or wider basin of global basin of attraction because it has convexity in translation and dilation that exactly captures how the data and the parameters continuous dependence. And that is responsible for a lot of the success we see in this area or in this usage. And the second uh, ch challenge we see is that in, if we don't add any, if we don't add any, add any regularization, we will see a lot of data overfitting. And uh, one particular property of the Russian sand distance is robust to high frequency noise, and that goes hand in hand with one the definition of optimal transport, and the second is connection with H minus one semi norm. So the idea of using different metrics in a lot of inverse problem or in inverse data fitting problem is not just limited to optimization. Because for example, as a loss function, the implicit regularization metric we see, what I talk about today is about PDE constraint optimization. But similar effect, which I just briefly mentioned in the last 10 minutes, similar effect can also be observed when you do Bayesian inference and if you want to be robust to noise. And finally, we also push this idea a little bit in, the, in solving the forward problem. Because sometimes when we solve the forward problem, uh, we may formulate a variational approach. And that will also involve minimizing the residual. And by a change of residual, for example, we change from L2 to H minus two, that demonstrate a great uh, speed up in solving second order elliptic PDEs such as Helmholtz equation. Because Helmholtz equation by itself has a tendency of biasing towards higher frequency. And that's why when higher frequency will convert faster, but the lower frequency converts slower. And if we use, for example, H minus two norm, that exactly counterbalance it to drag back to the fact that every frequency content will convert uniformly the same speed. And that will give us the faster overall convergence. So in the end, uh, it was just one step. Uh, it, I'm not say here to say you should always use uh, weaker norms or because earlier we also realized uh, weaker norms indeed make you robust to noise, but it give you low resolution. So I really like uh, my collaborator's uh, picture in his thesis, Lin Yun Chu's his thesis. He has one picture like this, which really express what I want to say or as a final conclusion message. For a lot of inverse problems, as we go from coerce to fine, no matter it's in frequency or in discretization, we often observe an increase in accuracy as a better and a better discretization. But as we observe a better uh, 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 accuracy, the stability also proportionally gets worse. And I think the best practice for a lot of those type of problems will be a combination of all those properties by doing stage by stage. And such techniques usually it's called frequency marching, frequency continuation, or multi-level, multi-scale, or, um, uh, or weighted frequency, but you change the weight uh, gradually uh, uh, different along the iterations. So I think that's my last slide and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yunan. That was a great uh, presentation. Uh, it gave us a, an overview as well as some new results that you've uh, achieved. Uh, we have several questions. Uh, people have raised their hands, so I'm gonna allow them to talk. The first question is from uh, Yuri Korolev. Yuri, go ahead and speak. Uh, hello, well, thank you very much for uh, your very interesting talk. Uh, I've got two questions, one a bit more theoretical and the other one a little bit more practical. So first of all, uh, you said that with the Wasserstein two distance, your um, objective convexifies. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, does this uh, mean that the when you lift the problem to measures that the forward operator linearizes somehow? Uh, no, there's a, so the, the problem that didn't come from that I lift the sesame signal to measures. The property is not come from that, but the property is really because uh, the vertices and distance uh, compare things in a very different way. If you just lift a uh, sesame signal to measures, you can still compare measures by L2 norm, for example, and that doesn't help. Uh, sure, sure, but uh, well, I meant lifting two measures and then changing the, the metric on the space of measures. Mm -hmm. That it, does the operator linearize them if you consider it as an operator from whatever input space to the space of measures? Uh, uh, well, with also certain distance, if you you know make a norm space out uh, space out of it in whatever way. Uh, it's it's a very it's a vague question, but I was just wondering if someone thought about this. So uh, in sesame inversion, that uh, because for example, if we want to obtain a gradient, then there's a part of the gradient of the wave equation because the nonlinear inverse problem. And that part remain fixed is the part that uh, dj d, df, the data feature derivative that get changed. Mm -hmm. So what I mm -hmm. consider is, uh, um, so let's say this is the, it's probably not the best way. So this is the direction of the, like L2 mm -hmm. want to decrease. So d, dj df in L2 give you one direction, usually f minus g, okay. But when you project f minus g into the d, df dm, if they are orthogonal, that's where the gradient gets zero and you didn't feed the data. That's, a, that's mm -hmm. a, all the problem come from. The problem come from that it, it's not that either of them is zero. Neither of them is zero. Neither of them is zero. But because you didn't feed the data, uh, therefore it's really because they are orthogonal or close to orthogonal. But the change mm -hmm. of objective function basically say, okay, this is still the DFDM direction. But now I'm more, because I'm aligning with this direction, that's why I was, talking about the continued dependence because of vicious and distant comparison in exactly similar to how wave propagate. And that, then that makes mm -hmm. this two kind of parallel rather than orthogonal. And that's why you won't get stuck at places L2 get stuck. So that's, uh, uh, I think that's really fundamentally why we have a better convexity. Okay, thank you so much. And another more practical question, uh, if you have a measurement uh, how do you estimate the level of noise in terms of the Wasserstein distance? So uh, what, what if, you, if you have measured something, uh, what do you expect the Wasserstein distance between your measurement and the true signal uh, to be? Uh, that's, that's actually a very good question. I think in this situation, you don't know uh, because you, so the best scenario is there's a cutoff. So you feel like say you take a full transform of your data and that then there's a cutoff where the frequency, the noise and the, the noise content versus the physical content has a scale separation. If they don't have a separation, then uh, we won't be able to, we basically, so what the virtual and distance is, I will ignore the rest, where the physical part also gets uh, ignored. So here we basically hope that there will be a separation, such that if you ignore the higher frequency, you can still reconstruct uh, the image based on all the physical uh, information in it. Um, I, I think there's no way to know a priori unless uh, there's a prior knowledge about it. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Manny Ko. Manny, I'm going to let you talk as well. Oh, hi. hi. Oh, very interesting talk because I personally am also a big fan of uh, Bosch sign and optical transport. Okay, so I, uh, the, on the, um, Implicit regularization, it really makes me think that that's really uh, why M machine learning models uh, have uh, overfits, uh, which has been studied recently by you know, like neural attention kernel and other uh -huh. kind, and also Rebecca yeah. also used functional space perspective. So I wonder whether, I'm sure you have thought about that, right? Uh, yeah. uh, you know, but the other, uh, and uh, the other one is my more of my uh, wondering uh, you're using W2, uh, which, you know, is attractive because numerically it's, uh, it's more efficient to solve and everything. But there are other statistical reasons to use uh, P not equal to. Can you just comment on that also? Uh, sure. So for the first one, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, so I, I, I think I follow up a little bit on the neurotangent kernel line of research. So they basically derive the residual decrease 
based on, uh, so the linearity is a problem and then you can see the dynamics, how the residual decrease. And uh, clearly the dynamics or the, literally that was a gradient flow. If you choose a different objective function, you will get a different gradient flow. And uh, using different objective function may make you to be insensitive to the noise. So that's, that could be one reason why uh, using weaker norms, if in that setting would be uh, observed, will be ob is observed to be more noise robust. I, I think I can, I, I, can, I can relate to that. And for the second question, uh, the choice of p equal to two and p equal to one, uh, that's, that, that's, they are the, both the major choices. I, I don't think I see any p equal to others, but it's theoretically studied in mathematical analysis. So p equal to two has slightly advantage in theory because it has a unique uh, optimal map. But for uh, p equal to one, uh, even if the minimization problem is solved, you have numerous uh, equivalent optimal maps that will not be a great uh, in some proof, for example. And a numerical implementation uh, for p equal to two, there is uh, a Marshall Parry equation and there is a banner mubre uh, dynamic formulation that offer a lot of way to, to, to solve. So that's also one numerical reason why I, I, I like to study W2 distance. But uh, I have to say uh, there's in sesame community, sesame inversion community, there's a lot of research has been done about W1 norm and they, they prove to be equally effective as W2. So here there's a no major, I think the only slightly difference is really numerical, uh, how, to, how you compute the WP norm. If you choose W1, you probably need to go for linear programming. But if you go to W2, you, you may go for dynamical uh, formulation or a uh, Marshall Perry equation. Mm. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you, yeah. Uh, but also, I just want to make a comment that uh, the nearly orthogonal uh, 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 phenomenon happens a lot in high dimensional because if you're doing random sampling of a vector, uh, they, they, the, uh, then so, and if you're doing stochastic gradient descent, one can imagine the situation one, uh, one can be in, right? So yeah. I really love your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? If you have a question, please raise your hand. Oh, uh, I have to see one here from uh, Dali. Da, you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, thank you, Yuna. Thank you for your inspiring talk. Uh, I have a question. So when you compute the Wasserstein distance, uh -huh. so uh, did you get a accurate uh, solution or you got an approximated solution? So is there any problems in this area? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a good question because uh, if if we don't compute the Wasserstein uh, uh, distance or its Fritzsche derivative accurately, it is expected to be reflected in the image re you reconstruct. Uh, here, I do a particular way of doing that. So this is a list of ways I know, I see a lot in solving optimal transport. And uh, in, in the numerical example that you saw earlier, I use 1D explicit solution, which means I solve the optimal transport analytically without any error, apart from numerical error. So that's, uh, that's actually help a lot. I also have tried the Marshall Perry equation, and I also see other people have tried a different um, methods. So a lot of them will depend on iteration. For example, linear programming, solving Marshall Perry equation, or even for solving fluid dynamics formulation, the third one. That, that need your iteration. And when you decide to stop the iteration, that the computing the Vashis and Deason will, expect, will be expected to affect your reconstruction. And my, I have only tried W2, but I think W2 is not as, uh, as good as just 1D solution. And I think the numerical error of solving Marshall Perry equation actually play a role. Okay, thank you, Yuna. Um, are there other questions? If not, let's stay on that uh, 1D optimal uh, transport explicit solution. So you're matching the, uh, uh, you're computing the uh, Wasserstein distance trace mm -hmm. by trace, is that what yeah. you meant? Yeah, 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 they call trace by, it's the Vigo that we saw at the beginning. Okay. Vigo by Vigo, yeah. And how do you uh, lift it up so that it's a measure? Uh, that's actually also a very important question. It's, uh, it's very important in the way, if we don't normalize it in a reasonable way, uh, it can total fail. All the put properties is just all gone. So here, I wonder if I have slides, yeah. So I tried several different uh, normalization. Uh, there are several principles behind it. 
one principle is we cannot hurt the data. Like all the raw data has all the physical information. We cannot change the physical content of it. So for example, taking up value or square scaling kind of change it because we change the frequency. We also uh, blur the, so for wave there's a polarity and the polarity matters. And once we scale them in this way, the polarity is gone. Uh, negative, positive become the same. And the second, uh, we want to be like say bijection. So bijection, which means I can easily go back and forth rather than there's any significant information loss. And also we want it to be highly differentiable or smooth. So here I also uh, tried almost like very smooth normalizations. Recently I have seen people doing uh, different scaling, but it's basically in the same vein. Uh, you want to uh, you want it to be bijection and very smooth. But here I I, I have wrote a, I have written a paper uh, uh, in this area, and I think it's still a big problem because uh, there's no optimal transport theory for sound measures. Uh, so although there have been a lot of mathematical framework for unbalanced or unnormalized optimal transport, which means you have two one pair sound and the other doesn't have the same volume, then how you do that? There, there's a lot of development, but there's very, very few research works in uh, how to deal with sand measures. So uh, it's still a very tricky question. Yeah. Great, thank you. There's one last question. I think we can, uh, uh, it is from Fedor Goncharov. Fedor, uh -huh. go ahead and talk. Okay, you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it was a really pedagogical and very clear even for non-specialists uh, as me. Uh, I was just wondering, um, just for my personal interest, uh, in general, using this Wasserstein distance uh, approach, um, how scalable it is, uh, what are the difficulties to apply it, for example, to really huge, I don't know, three-dimensional, uh, high-dimensional inverse problems, like say in geophysics? Ah, uh, uh, yes, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I never deal with 3D, uh, a wave, but I deal with 3D compare, like solving like a density function of focal point equation. That's what's in 3D. So that's what I did before. But uh, I think the major difficulty here is still is really the computation. Usually, if you do linear programming, you have to formulate a very very big uh, uh, cost matrix. So that's a cost matrix that you keep looking at. Oh, how far away these two are from each other. So I can see in 3D there will potentially be a memory issue because in 3D the cost matrix will be more ginormous. And another is a computational. Uh, I think those linear programming problem, they, they scale uh, with n, either n log n or n square. So uh, as you go for higher dimensions, your n will inevitably getting bigger. So the good thing is I have seen a lot of uh, papers presenting 3D example, especially very, very large scale geophysical 3D examples like the Chevron blind test, uh, 20 kilometer by 40 kilometer, et cetera. So I think it's doable, but there is a, a huge amount of computational cost associated with that. And that's for 3D, for physical problems. But if some people saying, uh, we, we want to compare, uh, compare points cloud, and that's like 100 dimension. And for those type of application, uh, I see people doing slice the Washington distance. It's a very, very uh, scalable technique because that's the Vashistan distance is like redon transform. It's like CT. You have a one thousand dimensional object. You project it to 999 dimension. And uh, once you project, you only get a 1D trace and you only compare it trace by trace. So, so, um, so basically you solve 1D optimal transport problems after projection. And then uh, you integrate over all the angles. So that's one way to deal with that. Uh, that's a, a lot of the data science applications use the slice the larger sand distance is relatively well developed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so you think that slice the sand distance, for example, the radon transform you just said in the last uh, in, in the end, uh, it could be interesting to apply for three D for for large scale case. I yeah. Mean, yeah. It's, it's a but I, uh, I think. Sorry, sorry. I, I do believe there's the linear programming has also okay. been used to, for three D. Okay. 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 Uh, may I comment? Is that because I work in three D graphics and uh, mm -hmm. the point point clouds and uh, yeah, the computation is a problem, but it's actually a lot of work has gone into it. Uh, yeah, slice Wasserstein is one of them because once it's projected, the 
you have an analytical solution, especially yeah. if you have uh, circular, if you have a circular domain. And yeah. uh, entropic regularization actually, yeah, you can solve it using a Sinhon uh, uh, algorithm, mm -hmm. and it's extremely GPU friendly. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the, the work done by uh, uh, Solomon uh, at MIT from yeah. Stanford, uh, he yeah. they they also show work. They work in geometric domain, and they the entropic regularization has the advantage that uh, you can use almost like a uh, uh, it's almost like a low frequency to high frequency type uh, oh, mindset. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, the, the multi-scale, yeah. Multi-scale, yeah, yeah. Anyway, and the fluid dynamics one is very important when you are doing synthesis or when you want uh, a, a spatial coherence in your transport map, which is important if you're doing uh, generated modeling. Uh, I, so, yeah, so that's just uh, that's my personal comment. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. I think another thing I didn't mention when I was introducing Optimal Trust was a lot contributing to the rise in the past one decade. <laughs> It cannot be detached from the development in CPU, GPU, etc. Okay. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, so we're at about some questions. I think uh, we can continue the discussion offline. You can uh, certainly uh, you know, some, uh, some specific questions later on after you've uh, reviewed your talk. Yunan, thank you so much again for your. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.